Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back. If you are here for the morning session, welcome. If you're just joining us, um, if you were here for the morning session, you're going to hear me repeating a few things. Um, the first thing is I would like to thank uh, the team at Bickle, um, Liam behind the Bickle logo, um, as well as the events team more generally, who are helping us obviously with coordinating this marketing, etc. Um, the organizing committee, um, who were a great help for myself and Barry as we put this program together um, and even before we started putting the program together um, their assistance was ridiculously helpful. Um, I also wanted to thank all those who submitted abstracts for this webinar series and obviously um, both those who were accepted to be on the various panels and those who have not um, we're sorry we couldn't accept everyone's. Um, however, we do really appreciate that you took the time to submit those abstracts. I also wanted to thank obviously all the speakers today and uh, the chair, Leslie Ann specifically, as well as the chairs throughout the 10 webinars across the series and the audience who's been uh, great in terms of asking questions, raising comments, making and um, providing feedback, um, both feedback during the sessions, but also before and after through social media, etc., etc. Uh, one quick logistical point, you do have a Q&A box on your um, Zoom screens. If you do have a question that you would like to ask, please do write those in and please do so as we go along. Um, Leslie Ann will be kind of filtering through those questions and asking them either right after the presentations or at the end. We can't promise that we will have time to get to all of them. However, we will try our best and I can reassure you that all the speakers will be looking at those questions and thinking about them even if we don't have the opportunity to actually address them over the course of the presentations or over the course of the webinar today. Um, I think that's it from my end, so I'll hand over to Barry. Thank you, Jean-Pierre, and welcome everyone um, to the fourth day um, of this webinar series and the second half of the fourth day. Um, for those of you who weren't with us uh, earlier, my name is Barry Sander. I'm an assistant professor um, of international justice at Leiden University. Um, and it's a real delight uh, to welcome you to uh, this particular webinar on the international law teacher. And a particular delight to introduce our chair, um, Leslie Ann Dubik Pauli, um, who is senior lecturer at King's College London. Um, she has a very distinguished uh, teaching and publication profile, including a landmark text, The Prevention Principle in International Environmental Law. Um, but also a fun fact is that uh, Leslie Ann and I are actually pretty good friends and we were um, teaching assistants together back in the day uh, at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, and that's how we first met. Um, so it's really great uh, to be able to invite her to chair uh, this particular session. Um, and that's all I really have to say. So I'm delighted to hand over to you, Leslie Ann. Over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Barry and, and Jean-Pierre, and congratulations on putting together such a fascinating uh, series. I think it's really helping us um, have a fresh look at what teaching international law means. And I think it's uh, even more necessary now that the circumstances are really dictating that uh, we reflect even more more on our teaching practices. And I think it's, it's also great that it's giving us an opportunity to bring all of us together as a community in those uh, very difficult times. Um, so today, the title of a panel is, is rather intriguing and, and mysterious. We're going to talk about the international law teacher. Um, so who is the international law teacher? Are they just law teachers or are there something else? What do they do? Uh, what kind of values do they have and what uh, really influences them? Those are all questions that we're going to be uh, discussing today. Thanks to our uh, five presentations. So we have quite a, a busy schedule ahead of us. Um, and uh, so I'm going to ask the speakers to uh, present for around uh, 12 uh, minutes uh, and then we'll have the Q&A and a in the discussion at the end after uh, the five presentations. But um, I'm really encouraging uh, the audience to uh, post their questions on the Q&A uh, chat um, as we go through so that you don't forget your questions uh, and then I'll, I promise I'll have a look at them and I'll try to ask as many questions uh, as uh, we can and hopefully we can also um, draw comparison and uh, try and find some uh, common themes uh, between all the presentations. 
Uh, so we're going to uh, get started uh, with uh, Richard, uh, Richard uh, Mackenzie Gray Scott, who is a consultant at the Vegan Center for the Rule of Law, and he's going to talk to us about social class and what it means about our teaching in international law. So Richard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, just a troubleshooting issue, if you can hear me okay, just a thumbs up, cool. Yeah. All good. So uh, I want to start off by saying, obviously, thank you to Jean-Pierre and Barry for organizing this webinar series and to also all of you at home for taking part. I'm going to keep my comments pretty brief because I don't want to eat into other people's time. I also look forward to the discussion at the end. Now, I'd also like to clarify from the start that I've only taught international law in England and Lithuania so far. And undertook my studies in England, Scotland, and the US. So my comments are going to reflect those experiences in addition to some of the research that I've undertaken. And for that reason, perhaps some of the things I say might be relevant to teaching international law in other parts of the world. But one thing I have come to learn from my own experiences is that it helps classroom settings considerably when teachers appreciate different approaches to learning across cultures and then adapt to whatever context they find themselves in. Because you know what works in one context might not necessarily work in another. And I think it's important not to push a particular teaching methodology in a particular place if it doesn't fit. Now, the rest of what I'm gonna to say today basically can be broken down into two parts. First, just because the subject is so substantial, I'm just gonna give a little bit of context on social class in terms of what it can encompass. And then second, I'm just gonna provide a few examples that concern social class and the teaching of international law. So social class itself is multidimensional. It can be hard to measure and also depends on the metrics used to differentiate between class groups. For example, class categorizations can be based on the three Cs, which are cash, credentials, and culture. And cash essentially refers to financial resources. Credentials refers to levels of formal education and occupational status. And culture refers to you know, individual backgrounds, behaviors, and mindsets. But these are just some examples of metrics that can be used to determine social class and many more exist. Basically just what I'm trying to get at is that social class is a very fluid concept which can take into consideration various factors. So with that in mind, I'm just gonna move on to some issues that concern social class and the teaching of international law. And I do think that these issues can be addressed by instilling a mindset in teachers that sort of looks beyond classroom settings to consider factors that students have to deal with outside of classrooms, which again, depends on their class background. And the first issue is that a number of studies show that a teacher's failure to consider socioeconomic diversity within classroom settings makes students less likely to consider uh, job prospects in the subject area that you talk. So this means if we want an the international law profession to become more diverse in socioeconomic terms, then the way in which it's taught also needs to become more diverse. And in this respect, a factor that I think can be better accounted for is that student bodies are becoming more diverse. However, I do question whether the diversity of student to staff interactions mirrors this cohort diversity. And in this respect, I think student-staff interactions could be improved by sort of putting to one side the teacher-student distinction as far as possible. And that a sort of classroom ethos is instilled that students have as much to teach as teachers and teachers have as much to learn as students. And one teaching method I think aids in the practice of putting to one side this teacher-student distinction can be found in another subject and that's economics which during teaching encourages students to interrupt teachers and this can provide a, a nice interactive environment and it's also different to relying on the q a method of teaching which sometimes doesn't work because you know you ask questions and they're then met with this you know silence and this is also important for another reason which relates to students' self-esteem and morale. 
which research shows also is impacted by their social class. And I think even seasoned teachers can miss the mark on this matter, um, which is accounting for introverted students. And teaching methods, especially those in law, I think heavily favor students that act or are extroverted. And in some places, extroversion is actually rewarded instead of the ability to understand material and critique it. But I've certainly found that being informal with students and encouraging things like this, the interrupting type um, method, if you can call it a method, uh, results in you know, wider class participation and also helps boost uh, student self-esteem and morale. And I think this is important for another reason. And like I said, many students are going to have other things to deal with outside of the classroom, which can negatively impact their self-esteem and morale, depending on their social class. So bearing in mind this context of dealing with different situations outside of classrooms, in the teaching of international law, especially at the postgraduate level, there's a lot of money circulating in the process of student education outside of formal institutions, which provides advantages to some students and disadvantage to others. And two significant examples that I am aware of are paying for additional private tutoring, which includes hiring people to write essays and dissertations and the like, and teachers also offering unpaid work. And there are many implications of these practices, but I just wanna focus on two just because of the time constraints. And the first is that students from low income backgrounds will likely be working a job on top of their studies, maybe even more than one. And this means they're not gonna have the time nor be able to afford work that does not pay. And a significant part of this is that from an employment standpoint, crucial factors to securing a job after graduation are work experience and professional networks. Now, if teachers are offering unpaid work experience, then these teachers are advantaging students that can financially afford to undertake unpaid work. And what this means is that less well off students in financial terms uh, won't have those experiences when they graduate and are therefore less likely to land a job. And I personally think that the international law profession could be more diverse, but in order for that to happen, the differences in personal finances between people need to be better accounted for so that people's financial circumstances do not impede or enhance their chances of forming part of this profession. And I think teachers can help address this matter by offering paid work and also rethinking the ways in which their pro bono programs operate within their institutions especially so as not to exclude students from low-income backgrounds. And the other matter I mentioned is that some students uh, pay for additional tutoring and get people to write their essays and whatnot. And these students can appear to be better because of the current ways in which educational systems grade students. And that again has impacts in the world of employment. Students with the highest grades also appear to prospective employers that they will be the most suitable employees. Now, I do know and appreciate that teachers in international law have to work within whatever system they're assigned with respect to, you know, grading and how courses are examined. But I would like to say that maybe people that teach can push institutions a wee bit more to change the ways in which they measure student learning in a way that takes pressure off students and removes what can be a toxic attitude of competition that in extreme cases leads to the type of cheating, like for example, getting a PhD level researcher to write an undergraduate essay for one of their courses. So in closing, I just wanna offer two key takeaways for how teachers in international law can positively address matters concerning social class when they teach the subject. And the first is, like I mentioned, implementing methods that improve students' self-esteem and morale whilst they learn the material. And I think classrooms can be a welcome escape for the strains of everyday life, and not just for students, but for teachers as well. And the last thing I'd just like to end on is, don't offer 
unpaid work opportunities to students because doing so is heavily favoring students from financially privileged backgrounds. And I'll just leave that there. Thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Richard, for such a clear presentation. Um, and I think you're raising already really interesting questions about how we how do we diversify our teaching in order to diversify the profession, a very important question, and what kind of methods do we need to actually use to uh, help with this diversification? And I like your uh, interrupting method. I, I quite like this concept. So if any of you in, in the audience has uh, been using this method or uh, is all also thinking about other ways of trying to open up our teaching and therefore the profession, uh, please do also share, if, even if you don't have questions, but also share your own experience uh, in the chat. Right, so now we're going to move to our second presentation, and that's uh, Yusra Suedi, who's a researcher uh, at the Global Studies Institute at the University of Geneva, and she's going to uh, talk to us about how to uh, humanize the teaching of international law. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Leslie Anne, for your um, kind introduction and thank you um, Barry and Jean-Pierre for giving me the opportunity to say a couple of words on this topic um, that is a, a super um, passionate topic for me. So um, the message of my presentation today is going to be very simple but before I actually get into it I would like your opinion on something. Um, panelists and attendees alike so I'm going to ask the uh, BICL organizers to, um, or the organizer in this um, panel, to please um, put up the poll that I've prepared. And I'd like you to just answer a really simple question. Um, what are, what in your opinion, are law students' main criticisms about international law? Like, what have you heard? Or if you haven't heard anything, what do you think? Um, this is obviously not an exhaustive list. And uh, you can check several things if you would like. I'm just gonna give a couple of seconds for people to fill that out. Okay, maybe, maybe we should wrap that up. So if I can just, have a little look, see what came out of that, if that's possible. Ooh, okay. So we have, you know, most people said, okay, not real law. And by the way, there were a lot of other options here. So too political, too abstract, et cetera. Those are the ones that came to mind for me. Um, and the truth is we've probably all heard some of these reservations towards international law, right? I could actually, spend all night going into each of them and add so many more to the poll that I gave you guys. But actually the one that I wanna focus on is perhaps the one that actually got the, the least amount of, um, of votes here. And that's the issue of it being a little bit too abstract, okay? So when you say too abstract to me, that can mean several things. One of those things is that it's just not clear cut enough. It's just not straight to the point enough, okay? But something else that might come to mind is the idea that it's quite removed. Like it's quite out of the realm of my reality. Um, this has nothing really to do with my life or, you know, it's, it's a lot of grandeur. It's a lot of big states and organizations. And, you know, where do I fit into that? as a student. So I came across this um, website um, that was actually, um, it's not a website, it's a web page on the site of the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, I'm based in Switzerland. And um, it really caught my eye, I found it really interesting and I wanted to just show you guys. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen. If you can see, and it says, public international law in our daily lives. If you scroll down, and here's a little, little description, international law is not just for lawyers. It affects our daily lives, whether we're buying bananas at the supermarket or medicine at the chemist. Here are some everyday examples. I will happily send you guys that link. 
Um, I know that it caught your attention though. And the reason for this is because you probably felt for a moment like, oh, wow, this, this relates to some of my kind of everyday activities. This is cool. Like, I want to see what the connection is. Maybe there's some things that wouldn't immediately come to mind, right? And I think the point of them putting this up on their web page is to kind of say like, hey, look, guys, international law actually does have to do with you more than you might think it does. And why is this important? This is important because psychologists um, in educational psychology research have actually looked into what cultivates interest in the classroom to figure out what, what it is that really gauges a student's interest, okay? And while there are many things, um, I gathered a bunch of uh, research and reports that are in the paper that um, I hope to publish as a result of this panel. Um, and uh, most research actually said that interest, and I quote, is triggered by content, associations, and experiences that are highly individualized and specific, okay? So this can be achieved by, for instance, personalizing subject matter or signaling that personal gain is imminent, okay? So essentially what a student, not every student, but probably a lot of them are asking is, what does this have to do with me? There's like a little bit of narcissism in there <laughs> um, in a way. And so, I find this really interesting because the reality is that international law is taught in a simplistic and a little bit of a state-centric way. And let me explain. This shouldn't come as a surprise because of its history, but what you'll find in a typical textbook or um, a syllabus is the implication through the structure and through the content that people like you and I, individuals, we're kind of only relevant in international law in the context of international human rights law or international criminal law or international humanitarian law. So you kind of have those areas where it's like, oh, we have, we have a role to play, here we are. And then there's just everything else that is just very removed from, or doesn't really have that much to do with us, right? Um, so, this can be seen in a bunch of international law textbooks that um, I looked through for the purposes of this research study in English and French. And um, the only exception that I could find is this, Evans, <laughs> Evans textbook, okay? Where um, in this textbook, you have Professor Robert McCorkadale, whom I'm sure you all know, who actually does a brilliant job at arguing the relevance of people like you and I in international law across the board. So not just in those very specific areas that have to do with you know, individual rights or individual obligations. So I really approve of this because international law is a lot more nuanced than that. Individuals contribute to international law across the board in every possible area in one way or another. And I think that bringing this out in teachings would probably engage our students a lot more because they'd really be able to see themselves more in the discipline. And this could make a difference from a psychological perspective. So I'd like to give just a couple of really brief examples of um, just the areas in which it's very kind of state focused and some elements that we might not think of straight away that actually do have to do with us a little bit more than we would think, okay? So um, let's take the example of treaties, okay? Treaties that are um, explained typically under the sources of international law. Something that is often amiss from teaching or textbooks or syllabi is the role of, that people like you and I can have in the form of civil society especially in lobbying that will kind of amount to whatever we see in a treaty. So think of the Rome Statute, think of the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, or think of a series of environmental law treaties. Um, something else, which is perhaps a little bit more, um, you know, less known is in customary international law. 
I don't know if you knew that people like you and I can actually contribute. Um, we can actually be relevant in the formation or the expression of rules of customary international law. And this has actually been explicitly stated by the International Law Commission in its draft articles on customary international law of 2018, also by the ICJ um, in the Costa Rica, Nicaragua navigational rights case of 2009. So just some examples of things that don't really come across, but um, I can think of, you know, if we're talking about state responsibility, this perhaps more people would know because it relates a little bit more to IHL and human rights, et cetera. But of course, acts of individuals such as ourselves can be attributed to the state. Um, and also states can claim reparations um, in the interest of an individual, for example, like us, who benefits from an erga omnis obligation, which was violated by another state. So that's another example. Um, when we're talking about subjects of international law, um, most textbooks will feature very little on you know, individuals just being like, oh, human rights gave individuals rights and then criminal law gave individuals kind of responsibility. But what perhaps something else that isn't mentioned is you know, civil society as, um, I mentioned civil society because they defend our interests um, and it can be considered as like an aggregate of individuals in a way. So civil society, I saw in a French uh, textbook by Pierre-Marie Dupuis, um, kind of an argument about civil society actually being subjects of international law, which is something interesting to consider. I could go on, there are a little bit more specialized areas if we think of you know, territorial boundaries and when textbooks talk about that, they basically just talk about um, you know, the different state dominated rules. And I think that when the ordinary person thinks about territorial boundaries, they're probably thinking like, well, what happens to me if a certain boundary between two countries is changed and I'm like living right next to that boundary? What does that mean for my life? What does that mean for my property rights? What does that mean for um, different rights that I may have or my nationality or my identity, okay? Um, there are a lot of different areas um, that I've covered a little bit more extensively in my paper, but the bottom line is that I think it's way too two-dimensional to pretend that there's kind of this area where we play a role and then everything else where we don't. Um, the truth is that we're involved everywhere and to be even more extreme and perhaps a little provocative, um, <laughs> the state is essentially a construct, international law is essentially a construct. We are of course at the heart of that. We are of course at the heart of it all. So we are involved. And I'm not saying that any of the examples that I've given are major contributions. I'm not staying, saying that we're the stars of the show or that we're the main players in the game. Um, I, I do believe that states really are the main you know, actors in, in, in the international legal system. And some of these examples are super modest. Um, I do recognize that but they do exist. And I think that the importance is in these little details. Um, I think that we should kind of bring out those little details and pieces of information as much as we can. And everything we talk about and teach, there should be a moment when we're like, okay, this is how this relates to you specifically, or this is how you are actually involved in this discipline. Because I think that this will gauge more interest in the classroom from a psychological education standpoint. I also think that it'll make international law more accessible from a professional and personal perspective, and that it will essentially just reflect the reality of international law as a system that people like you and I are constantly shaping and being involved in. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much. Such a fascinating talk. Um, so if you if you have a look at, at the chat, uh, Richard and, and Barry have also been uh, sharing uh, some uh, literature that is quite interesting. It has, I think, reminded us also of uh, the American society's work uh, on how international law shapes our lives. And also, uh, as Barry has pointed out, how international law also can negatively affect uh, our lives. Um, so I think it was it was interesting to see um, your, your thoughts on how to personalize international law and the experience uh, that students can have of learning about 
uh, international law. And, and I know it, it has reminded me a bit of, of what I do when I do an introduction to international environmental law is that I ask students to actually uh, look at how international law has affected uh, the protection of the environment in their own country. Um, and it's such a lovely exercise because we have students really coming from all over the world. So it's also celebrating the diversity of experiences that uh, students have and building on their own experience so that they also uh, feel valued. So I think that's I also that. um, an, an interesting, uh, maybe an interesting uh, proposal to add to our list of modest proposals that will uh, eventually, uh, I think, uh, change a little bit how we actually uh, teach international law. So now we're going to move to our third presentation and uh, Cal Rapp is going to uh, move us to uh, how to teach international law outside of a law school. He's a PhD a candidate in, in political science and international relations at the University of Southern California. And so he's going to tell us about how we actually teach and learn about uh, international law in the field of international relations. Thank you, Kai. Yes, and thanks everyone. Uh, good morning from, it would be sunny in about an hour, uh, Los Angeles. Um, as was mentioned, I'm coming to this from the field of international relations, so not from a law school, and I'm interested in how international law is taught in particular to um, graduate students in IR, um, looking in particular at sort of the uh, PhD level. Um, in that, there's sort of a two-pronged question, the first that led me to this was, well, how is this taught and how might it be taught better? Which then naturally leads to the question of, well, what's the goal of teaching it? Why is this covered in IR departments? And the sort of clearest answer is that there's often a lot of substantive overlap. The uh, topics that international law is concerned with are also topics of interest for IR scholarship and for IR coursework. And based on that, there's an understanding that students in IR benefit from having some understanding of how international law works, uh, the questions it deals with, and that these are able to be incorporated into, um, in particular, into social science research. With that in mind, I start by looking at, well, how is it taught currently? And I'd say, especially in the US, so I can't speak to all departments and all structures everywhere, but in the US, there's an approach I've termed the institutionalist approach, which usually begins with a brief introduction to some of the history of IL, um, a brief discussion of the sources, types of international law, before moving into often a week by week focus on different substantive areas. So you might have one week on law of the use of force, followed by a week on human rights, a week on environmental law, with the idea being that um, one IR scholar actually I quote in the paper version of the saying, you know, these are the things that we're really interested in are these topics. And we're interested in how international law um, intersects and touches upon these different questions that are either more in the wheelhouse of political science programs or are more, in theory, more speaking to those ideas. And one quote that I think really illuminates some of this um, from Beth Simmons, who's a leading IR scholar on IL 2001 said, it is not that hard to comprehend enough law to be able to ask and even answer questions that are interesting for the study of international relations. And I found myself continuing to come back to this. Um, these, this traditional approach tends to focus on International law is either a cause or consequence of political behavior. Um, there's a sort of attempt to turn it into really a variable, something that can be fixed and studied in a very positivist social science way. And I think there's two flaws or shortcomings there. Um, the first is this misrepresents the reality of international law. There's often um, just as a few cases that might highlight this a failure to appreciate how different legal regimes might create contrary obligations on actors, a belief that it's always clear if there is a treaty that this requirement must mean X or Y behavior. 
a deflation of sort of international law to creating yes, no, or binary categories. And that it's it removes the role of practice and the way that states and individuals use international law in the world. It creates a view of international law as either an institution, there is a treaty, so X or Y, or as a very clear cut sort of set of rules that can be isolated and stand on their own for the purpose of research. And in short, I would say that international law being a very multifaceted, complex thing that's developed over hundreds of years is often pretty hard to comprehend. And that there's harm done in international relations, teaching on it if there's a hand waving of, well, you don't need to know that much to ask the questions that we're really interested in. With that in mind, and sort of thinking, well, assuming that most IR programs are going to be fortunate to even have a semester long course that's available covering international law topics, you know, and asking, well, how can that time be best used? I advocate for perhaps out of place for what I would call a skills based approach. Um, an approach that puts a bit more emphasis on um, in incorporating training on how to interpret international law and a bit more awareness of the actual use and practice of international law in its current forms. Um, I think there's two, there's a couple of benefits here in both of these. And with interpretation, being that this is pretty central to how the law becomes understood and applied that it helps sort of increase the awareness of the complexity of this. It's not seen as, well, there is a treaty, so this must mean that X is now forbidden or that Y is now required. I think it also has a benefit of enabling students to continue looking into the areas of law that are of interest to them on their own beyond the course. If you have a semester long course, if you have six, PhD researchers in that class are probably going to have six very different substantive areas of interest. You're not going to be able to cover the amount of environmental law that one student might need while also covering the amount of trade law or um, World Bank practices that another student might need. There's too much material there to do quickly. I think focusing on setting up students with here are some of the skills so that you can go and do this on your own so that you know what you're looking at when you're reading, you know, draft commentary from the ILC. It also, I think, helps a bit with, you know, what happens when the law changes. If you're studying international law because you're interested in non-proliferation, well, you know, how does that change over time? If there's now the uh, nuclear ban treaty, hopefully you have some skills to be able to really engage with that and think through what that might mean for your research. And the focus on the practice and application of law, I think drives home the point that international law is often in many ways a process, that it's something that plays out and that we can't always look at it as cause or consequence. Um, driving home, well, how is international law understood and invoked by practitioners really clarifies that point. I think it also raises questions that are directly relevant for IR, where we're concerned with sort of power and the exercise of power, asking how is law used by those with varying degrees of power and for what ends sort of speaks directly to that goal. And then broadly, um, looking back on the skills-based approach as a whole, which doesn't advocate for tossing away, you know, do away with all the substantive weeks, but says, you know, rebalance a bit here, focus on developing these skills. I think this helps encourage IR research as a bit more attuned to the realities of international law that recognizes that complexity. I think it also opens up opportunities for greater interdisciplinary engagement. Um, several of the pieces and roundtables I was reading and planning for this highlighted, you know, Interdisciplinary work requires a certain level of respect and acknowledgement between the different disciplines that are being engaged. I don't think that international law always is engaged with that same level of respect in IR. Um, I can't speak to the other side of that equation, but 
if you're coming in with the assumption of, well, it's not that hard to know enough of this and it's not what we're really interested in, that's probably not the best starting point. Um, there's been some good work done looking into, we have these expectations of increase sort of the ability to communicate and coordinate should increase interdisciplinary work and it hasn't. And I think, you know, helping equip students with some of these tools to actually think about the law in a bit more of an applied, in a bit more of a really practical way might yield some benefits there. So just to wrap it up pretty quick there, and I apologize, I sometimes talk very quickly. Um, you know, if we're, think, if we're concerned with, well, we don't have much time, you know, if we assume one class max, how can that best be used to teach IR grad students about international law? On the one hand, we have the approach that sort of says, we're gonna briefly overview what international law is, and then week by week sort of do the greatest hits of treaty and customary law for different topics. Or, you know, if we propose maybe we take a bit more time and focus on developing skills around interpretation and a greater understanding of sort of the actual use, how law is employed. And that through this, we might see some benefits with both the, both the depth of research, a greater awareness of law is more than, you know, an independent or dependent variable or a fixed outcome, as well as, you know, encouraging students or in, enabling students to pursue their own work further. And, you know, greater uh, interdisciplinary exchange, as well as just deeper theorization within the international relations field. So I will wrap that up there. Um, again, I'm excited for the discussion to come, so. Excellent, thank you, Kyle, thank you so much. And um, and I think we, we now need to add a skills-based approach to our list of, of modus proposal for this uh, session. Um, I think your, your talk really resonated with, with, with my own teaching experience of, uh, of from the other side, uh, that is that I'm teaching international relations students who are coming into uh, a course with only law students. And I think it's also raising questions about how do we teach students uh, who do not major in international law, in, in law, and um, how can we actually make sure that also law students benefit from those interactions with students who are not from their own discipline? And how do we, do we actually uh, make the most out of this uh, diversity in, in, in the class? room. Uh, but I'm sure there are, are lots of, of people who have uh, questions uh, on the presentation so far who would also uh, like to share their own experience. Uh, so really, uh, this is just a kind reminder to uh, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box uh, and we'll go through them uh, at the end uh, of the presentations. But for now, we're going to move on to uh, Ana Luisa. Um, Ana Luisa Bernardino, she's a PhD candidate at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, um, and she's also a, a lecturer in public international law uh, at the University of Oxford. And uh, she's going to talk to us today about why international lawyers are not allowed to know. Ana Luisa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of this wonderful series of events for the opportunity to present my work, uh, especially Barry Sander, Jean-Pierre Cauchy, Liam Strachan, and of course, Leslie-Anne uh, Duvik, uh, Polly for chairing the event. Um, what I'll be presenting today is a book chapter, uh, which will be published later uh, this year in a volume edited by um, Andrea Bianchi and Moshe Hirsch on international laws, invisible frames, social cognition and knowledge production. Um, in international law. I do, however, plan to um, continue working on the topic for a broader, uh, broader project, so I'd very much welcome um, your questions and feedback. Um, I think it's safe to say that the majority of international lawyers uh, have been introduced to the discipline by reading a textbook. We resort to textbooks and textbook examples to show what international law really is. So my paper aims to invite international lawyers to a cognitive shift and to examine international law textbooks for what they do not teach us. I analyze textbooks as invisible frames that have a role to play in the intentional and unintentional production of ignorance in international law. 
The paper is interdisciplinary. I will be using cognitive sociology, which helps to explain how, as a collective, we are drawn to um, attend some issues and, and ignore others, why some things are perceived to us as the foreground and others are related to, uh, relegated rather to the background. I should say though at the outset that my aim is not to compile a list of things that most international law textbooks got wrong. This is not supposed to be uh, some sort of errata for these publications. My aim is not to pinpoint how textbooks got the interpretation of X case wrong or that they should include topics Y and Z and this should have been included in any such work. The selectivity of textbooks and of any cognitive process um, is inevitable. No textbook could possibly be exhaustive. It would actually cease to be useful if it were. Uh, so the purpose of my paper is rather to explore some of the things that international lawyers need to forget in order to know what they do, but also how some of these omissions constitute the conditions of possibility of current international legal discourse. I am to draw attention to the fact that every effort at the production of knowledge involves a parallel production of ignorance, which can be conscious or unconscious. For example, one textbook uh, justifies its decision not to expand on discussions of the Iraqi war, for example, because this would constitute excursions well beyond the ambit of a legal textbook, which should rather confine itself to an analysis of the principles of public international law when the law is being applied in a framework of normality. Now, social cognition scholars have shown us how attention is socially organized. So I'm interested in knowing what we are socialized into this attending as a disciplinary community, which is why I focus on textbooks. So textbooks provide one of the best objects for studying what international lawyers are socialized into this attending. So they represent the largely undisputed and uncontroverted knowledge of the discipline, the official point of view, if you like, they determine the questions and topics that are of relevance to international law. So they exercise what some cognitive sociologists have termed social mental control. And that is by telling us what to think about, what the questions of relevance to international law are, they also determine what we do not think about. And what we do not think about could constitute not merely some discrete blind spots of the discipline, but also some blind fields as Asia Freedom has called them. In international law textbooks, we focus on the sources, the subjects, international responsibility, dispute settlement, and we are otherwise blind to fields such as international finance, development, or international labor law, for instance. Ian Clabbers, for example, uh, recently gave the example of the field of labor law, which is one of the most treatified areas of the discipline with over 200 treaties and even more recommendations. And yet international labor law is rarely considered to be part of general international law or taught as such. And the same with international taxation and many more. So textbooks operate in a similar fashion to what Jacques Rancière termed the partage de sensible that is, they police our perceptual fields through a distribution of what is visible and what is not, what can be heard, what cannot. And Ranciere's example involves the orders of police officers move along, there's nothing to see here. So pages of textbooks of international law are not unlike such police orders, dividing up what there is to be seen and unseen in the world of international law. One particularly illuminating example can be found in the index of one of the most influential textbooks. Readers who search for the entry colonialism are readily directed to see decolonization. The message here is quite clear. There is nothing to see on colonialism. Let's move along, forget international law's complicity with colonial violence and also contemporary forms of neocolonialism and redirect the reader's attention to the decolonization movement and the 1960 declaration on granting independence to colonial countries and peoples as the definitive mark of the end of colonialism. Textbooks also constitute the discipline of international law in both senses of the term. 
they constitute international law as an autonomous field of study. One could say that the field emerged at about the same time as the first textbooks emerged, but they also constitute the discipline of international law in the sense of deeply influencing what one thinks about and what one does as an international lawyer. So textbooks teach us how to think like an international lawyer, how to identify an international legal problem, the kind of questions that one poses when faced with such a problem, as well as the kind of answers one can plausibly give to such questions. For instance, while international lawyers may not agree about the status or characteristics of different sources of international law, they generally agree that the doctrine of sources is a topic of major relevance to the discipline. In contrast, for instance, to the domestic context, where it is commonly experienced as a non-issue. Again, even if they don't tell us what to think, they are influential in demarcating what international lawyers think about. They offer a common language, which despite not being able to solve uh, disagreements about the law, it circumscribes the parameter in which such disagreement takes place. Essentially, they make sure that we, dis that we agree on the things that we disagree about. Textbooks can thus be understood as invisible frames, despite their blatant materiality, and most of them are quite difficult to miss with their many hundreds of pages, they insidiously claim an unmediated access to reality. They describe the law as it really is, a reality that is supposedly independent of the theoretical assumptions that their authors espouse. And the common view is nicely summarized by the US Supreme Court in the Paquete Havana case, where it stated that these works are relied upon not for speculations of their authors concerning what the law ought to be, but for trustworthy evidence of what the law really is. In my paper, I mention some things the textbooks draw our attention away from when structuring international uh, legal thought. So textbooks rarely spell out their theoretical and ideological assumptions. Many invite their readers, and I quote, to leave behind the glacial uplands of juristic abstraction. They claim that theories have limited relevance for solving actual problems of international affairs. In short, they try to give the impression that these works themselves are not based on the specific theories of the writers. They also usually contain highly decontextualized discussions of historical events or of international disputes. We are taught about text, cases, and materials, and we are otherwise blind to power, structures, and discourses. For instance, textbooks teach us to know the rules and principles in international law and to forget that these rules and principles have a certain history, that they are not natural givens, that there was something happening before a dispute was submitted, to international adjudication, but also something happened after the dispute was adjudicated. Now, take the standard treatment of the reparations for injuries advisory opinion, which invariably features in discussions of um, legal personalities of IOs. So textbooks describe the factual background of the case and the holding of the ICJ concluding, among others, that the UN had the capacity to bring a claim against Israel. There is no discussion, however, about what happened once the advisory opinion was rendered. Did the UN actually bring a claim against Israel? If so, in what forum? What was the outcome? Was the case settled instead? So I also focus on the hidden curriculum of textbooks, which is an expression coined by Anki Jihu to highlight the, lesson, the lessons which, although not openly intended, students in fact do learn. So many introductory, introductory chapters of these textbooks explain the importance and significance of international law to our lives by giving examples of how international law enables international telephone calls, uncomplicated postal services, travel by air, sea, and land. However, none of these topics deserve any attention in the later chapters of the textbooks, which are reserved for the core of international law, such as use of force, human rights, or state responsibility. So the message to be retained here 
is that international law is effective and it makes much of the world go around smoothly, but the allegedly most informative examples of the effectiveness and relevance of international law are considered to be of lesser relevance and unworthy of discussion in a textbook since they relate to the more mundane forms of international cooperation, the less glamorous sides of the profession. So international lawyers want to be seen as indispensable figures for international peace and justice, not a smooth operation of international postal services. Lastly, my uh, chapter also highlights how textbooks also determine um, um, some hierarchies of relevance. So the most conspicuous example relates to the treatment of the topic of the relationship between international law and municipal law. Virtually none of the most influential textbooks cover non-OECD member countries. The specific ways in which the treatment of different countries is presented also merits some further reflection. So one leading textbook, for instance, devotes its first section to the United Kingdom's approach with another section to the United States and a final section to other countries. The preface of another textbook also explains how it has been updated to include reference to decisions of courts in the US, the UK, the Netherlands and elsewhere. So only a couple of powerful states are deemed to be worthy of discussion and even naming. A quick survey of the titles of international law textbooks also sheds some light on some cognitive defaults, the marked and unmarked perceptual fields of the majority of international lawyers. So cognitive sociologist Eviatar Zerubovel gives the example of the need to qualify male nurses as opposed to the female nurse counterpart, uh, counterpart which is considered redundant as conventionally unmarked or taken for granted. Similarly, textbooks written by Global North scholars are commonly titled as International Law to Kur, contrary to textbooks written in the Global South, some of which present more modestly as an angled account of international law. So while these orders and hierarchies of relevance um, might strike as harmless as, as at first sight, they do bear some important consequences. So just like Georges Perec wrote, while the order of the alphabet may be arbitrary, inexpensive and neutral, the mere fact that there is an order um, means that sooner or later, or more or less, each element in the series becomes the insidious bearer of qualitative, uh, qualitative efficient. So a B movie will be thought of as less good than another film, which as it happens, no one has yet thought of calling an A movie. So um, these were some examples of the um, marked and unmarked nature of the titles of international law textbooks. Now, um, in, in my uh, paper, I also analyze how um, international law textbooks can also contribute to perpetuating certain stereotypes in international relations. So some authors speak of major states, implying that uh, some are minor. And one of the most influential textbooks discusses the relevance of a failure to act in ascertaining the existence of customary international law with the example that Chad consistently fails to send a man to the moon. As of now, of course, there are, to be precise, 192 UN member states that have consistently failed to send a person to the moon. So Wittgenstein famously observed that the aspects of things that are most important for us are hidden because of their simplicity and familiarity. I hope that my paper makes clear that neither the simplicity nor the familiarity of international textbooks should prevent international lawyers from appreciating their significant role in the constitution of the discipline. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Anna Luisa, for your um, analysis, critical analysis of
of the content of uh, textbooks. And, and uh, I think it also resonated with what we've been talking about in terms of the relevance of international law for our daily lives uh, um, and uh, how to actually diversify uh, our teaching and therefore also the, the profession. Um, so we're going to move to our last uh, presentation now, and that's uh, Ahmed Raza Memon and Eric Leofeld, who are both uh, lecturers in law at the University of, of Kent, and uh, are also going to be talking about uh, knowledge production uh, in uh, international law. Hi, everybody. Uh, so I'm just going to do this, share screen right now, and move on to a presentation. Um, I just did a whiteboard. I'm sorry, I was teaching today, so I should be okay. Screen, yeah, there you go. Okay, so so the so so, so our presentation is a bit uh, different in a sense that it's uh, it's not really prescriptive. We're not really giving any techniques for how to teach. We are talking about our podcast, so in some ways, also a plug for a podcast that Eric and I had started about two years ago, maybe about two years ago, almost two or three years ago, with the Center for Critical International Law here at University of Ghent, under the auspices of Dr. Luisa Slava, uh, Dr. Emily Heslam, and Dr. Sarah Kendall. Um, and uh, yeah, we're just hoping to kind of theorize uh, um, the podcast approach and how we approach pedagogy and podcast through this presentation. Um, Right, so so just to just to kind of a bit of a background to how we got to this idea for podcast, um, and here is an image of Sergeant Slaughter, who, if some of you don't know, he's a WWE kind of wrestler back in the day. Uh, the reason why we got into the podcast was a conversation between Eric and myself, um, and as you'll see more so from this uh, presentation, as being very different. Uh, it's incredibly informal. Uh, the the ways in which we've come to this uh, particular podcast is very informal. It is out of textbooks. It is outside the class. It is completely what I'd call the kind of background lives of of international law nerds and academics like those of us who are sitting right here. Uh, and attending perhaps and, and others within the academia. So we started this uh, podcast through uh, a conversation that we struck uh, on Facebook when we listened to a, another podcast, which is a political post podcast based uh, in the US called Chapo Trap House. Uh, there's a very interesting comment that Chapo Trap House made, which is a general imagination, uh, which obviously New Star's kind of presentation came about as well was a question of is international real law and this was a conversation Chapel Trap House was having while uh, there was conversation um, in the Security Council on the bombings uh, on Syria. Um, and um, obviously at that point, as we all know, uh, um, this kind of resulted in a huge kind of political kind of debate about the use of international law, the effectiveness of international law uh, for uh, purposes of humanitarian internet intervention in the politics of it. Uh, and so Chapel Trap House brought this up uh, and in fact made a very interesting comment uh, uh, on, and the episode title is based on the, the, the prolific uh, US uh, IR theorist uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter, um, as well as, uh, who was it, uh, Eric, another international law person, Samantha was it? Power. Sorry? Samantha Power. Samantha Power. So it was based on the kind of comments of both of these academics uh, and how they were talking about uh, the humanitarian intervention. And Chaco Trap House was incredibly critical of them. And in, in, in doing so, that's it, something very interesting, which was international law is for babies, so which means it's not effective. It's, it does nothing. Um, and obviously, I know I'm looking at some people's faces being like, well, that's such a you know, egregious thing to say. So we did react in the same way. And, and from there, Eric and I started to have a conversation. Well, um, how do we start talking about international law in a way where it's not this normative kind of yes law, no law kind of way, as, as uh, I know Kai was also talking about it, to people who think about political theory, international relations, but it's kind of presenting international law in a much more complicated way and, and from the critical traditions that Eric and myself both have been trained from, from both, uh, I've been consistently been in the University of Kent where we have a tradition of critical international law and Eric has previously been in, uh, in uh, SOAS as well for his masters. So that's how we started talking about uh, initially about what well, we should perhaps start a podcast to kind of interview academics and to talk about it. Um, 
And that's essentially another WWE reference, which was the Iron Sheik, uh, kind of, who has a whole colorful history himself as a person as well, who was a guard of the uh, Shah uh, before the Iranian Revolution and who kind of went to the US and was hired by WWE. Eric knows more about this history. And I think the story of the Iron Sheik is interesting in relation to both how uh, perceptions are created within the subject of international law, but also how they serve a particular purpose and how through the conversation and podcast, we kind of can uh, disentangle the ideas of world order that may be kind of, and, and specifically the role of international law in constructing the world order that people might not perhaps be having a conversation on, on when we think about international law, uh, particularly when you think about it from a very normative kind of perspective in a canonical teaching of international law. So <clears throat> that um, kind of resulted in us um, uh, kind of thinking of, of themes and names, and, and I'm just going to make it this part very short. Uh, the name in itself led to the actual contribution to pedagogy that we think we are currently developing in, in, in the format and theme of the podcast. Um, so this podcast, podcasts are generally in pedagogy thought about as you're producing knowledge and students are consuming that knowledge and you're producing it in an audio kind of format or a video format that's supposed to be accessible. This is the kind of very... Um, very cursory or very kind of, I, I would say also simplistic, but straightforward way in which pedagogy and podcast is think, thought about within the field of higher education. Uh, we didn't want to do that. Uh, we were more interested in, in kind of uh, thinking about the podcast as an opportunity to talk to academics, uh, knowledge producers, in a way where it was a dialogue. And the one thing that we settled, we started obviously from because, I mean, if some of you know Anthony Anki, Professor Anthony Anki, who is one of the first kind of progenitors of, of uh, third world approaches to international law that started off at Harvard University, um, um, we kind of came up with the names, the Anki boys. We thought it was a, but later on we were told by Dr. Luis that it was a bit too on the nose. And so uh, I think Eric has a better kind of story of how the name actually came about that we do have, uh, which I'm going to leave it to him to explain. Yeah, so anyways, uh, where the name came to how Fool's Utopia came about was, so first, yes, the Angie Boys, and then that was, uh, well, questioned. And um, so I was just asking various people I knew both within the field and outside, and then eventually um, someone who had a very good suggestion was uh, Dr. Uh, Giannis Kalpuzos of um, City University London, and he suggested a uh, full utopia. And I'm like, oh, that, that's really cool. And then uh, I remember it was me, Ahmed, and Luis were all having this meeting. And um, I bring up the name and Ahmed's like, wait, fool's utopia? I'm like, that's even better. Yes, that's what it's going to be. But then I tend to bring this back to questions of pedagogy and such. And a lot of this is just kind of reflecting on everything all of you have just said and got me thinking about this is really this matter of um, how exactly do we have these more informal discussions about these things, these things that uh, um, you don't really get just from uh, trying to do the reading, especially via things like textbooks that uh, maybe have all these lacks or present the certain um, information for a dehumanized capacity, but so much of the, um, how we end up knowing this is really through having these informal conversations with one another when we're not really in the official mode, we're just more relaxed, more at ease, and um, can then just, just be free in exchanging ideas and such. And I guess um, something then to be said about this and the whole medium of podcasting is one of the things we mentioned in a recent episode is we're kind of all podcasters now via being that we're just also uh, um, have to make use of these digital remote forms of communication, such as the one we are all participating in at this moment. And then where then um, is that opportunity, especially in a classroom environment and such, for um, having these discussions that allow us to fill in the gaps um, in relation to what the official canonical presentation of the materials leaves out. So um, 
that is something that we really try to do with the podcast and also theorize what exactly is our pedagogy? How do we engage in this dialogic function? And a big way in which we do that is uh, when we have our guests on, and our guests have varied from um, everything from senior figures in the field to people who are undergraduate student activists and such. So a big thing we ask is what was it about this that made you interested in this topic? What made you interested in international law or looking at international law from a critical perspective? Because it's not something that um, most people who end up in this world really started off being like, I want to be an international lawyer. I mean, maybe some, but uh, certainly not me and certain people <laughs> no. So how exactly do we reflect in this personal capacity talking to each other really as people. And that allows us to ask the deeper questions that uh, so much of the standard presentation of this really leaves out. And I guess just to wrap it up here, uh, the question we always end with, um, and one that has all sorts of um, implications for international legal thought is, what is your personal utopia? And that's one, and we know international law has this uh, um, has this sort of like reputation as, oh, it's just utopian, it's not real law, it's not really how nations interact. Uh, but then what is it about this idea that's just so powerful that despite all these critiques keeps us coming back over and over and over to it, but then there being this problem of what happens when uh, there is this preset prefabricated utopia that is compliance with international law or institutionally ordering the world, which I guess would then be the fool's utopia. So, well, how do we um, realize this is what we want, this is what's driving us, but in a way that we have come to uh, by virtue of just our own reflections and our own journeys that we can then um, find this medium to express with others. And I'd say if we're trying to really have any pedagogy that, um, that the podcast um, is trying to accomplish, then that's that. So yeah, I look forward to uh, questions and comments. Great, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, and perhaps you can uh, share the link to your podcast in, in the chat so that uh, the public also can uh, get access to, to it. I think um, it was really interesting to, uh, to see how you're trying to include diverse voices also. I thought that was interesting that you're inviting uh, undergrads and also the stars of international law and that this is also contributing to uh, diversifying uh, international law and thinking about how um, how the individual actually shapes international law and discuss this um, in, the, in the format of the podcast is really fascinating. Um, right, so now we have around a half an hour for uh, discussion and, and questions. And uh, I see there are already some questions uh, in the Q&A box, but uh, really your, your, if, if you also would like to uh, take the floor instead of writing your questions down, uh, please let me know and we'll uh, enable you to actually um, come on uh, live. Um, but so I'm going to uh, start with some questions from our audience. Uh, and the first one is uh, to Anna. Um, and that's uh, Yasuo who's asking, um, how do you construct your lecture about your untold topics in the limited number of lectures that uh, you would get in uh, the course uh, of uh, a module? So I think the question is really well, we, we you've given us some really food for thoughts about the limitations of textbooks and so how do we actually try to remedy the limitations that textbooks uh, have so if you have any thoughts uh, Ana Luisa uh, thanks so much for that question Yasu so I, I think it's um, it's always the challenge of uh, teaching a, a more critical perspective of international law, but I, I think that the, the way I would do it uh, is not to have yeah. one lecture um, and try to fit in untold topics of international law or what we are uh, taught to ignore, but really to try to weave in some of the important counter narratives of 
all topics that we we will cover in in our lectures when we teach i i think that's that's the the important part and just to realize that um whatever material you present it's not exhaustive there's always things that you are drawing your attention of the students uh, away from but making them also see that whatever they they are presented with there's always another side of the story there's always a, a counter narrative and there are always things that we don't uh, attend to in international law thank you um of course if anyone else wants to to contribute to the discussion just uh, feel free to uh, to to share your your thoughts as well um, I'm going to move to uh, Abdul Malik, who also has uh, a question, um, and that's uh, the reasons for the weakness of international law is, is locating the law, then projecting it to the world as a European intervention, therefore relying on uh, EU legal sources and, and international relations sources. Um, but um, it, they're saying that uh, when they were writing a paper, uh, on an Arab organization, um, regional organization, uh, they were struck by how both Western and local sources have completely overlooked uh, the organization. So it's about what we see and what we don't see and what we study uh, and what we decide not to study. So I don't know if any of our panelists has any thoughts on, on this. Uh, yes, Richard. Um, it's a really good question. I think one of the reasons behind it is definitely language limitations of people that do research and also teach international. And I'm speaking from a personal perspective here in that I you know, barely speak one language fluently. Um, and I think a lot of people that do international law research are relying on sources that are from English language um, materials. So when you're researching on you know situations or dynamics that are in other parts of the world where English is not the main language, it can maybe be find uh, harder to find um, resources in those other languages that can help inform your work. And I think uh, Anthea Roberts's book on is international on international. And I'm not read, I'm not going to claim to have read all of it, but she does make some from what I have read really good points about you know. English being the predominant language, and I think that is a definitely a reason why there's limited sources and limited topics for discussion when you're doing research. Leslie, if I can just come in, I think one <clears throat> additional point which I think just adds to the question rather than answers it is even if you look at what we look at in terms of organizations when we talk about the european context we obviously very quickly go from the regional to the sub-regional level and look at the eu but we almost never do that in the latin american or african context for example so we might look at the organization of american states but we never look at mercosur we might look at the african union but we never look at ECOWAS, for example whilst in the eu it's almost obvious and immediate that we look at the EU context. And that's partly because of different competencies of the organizations, but I think it's partly also because of our kind of very limited view of what is international law and what are those sources of international law that are coming through. Lovely. Um, so I had um, I had a few questions. I mean, I had lots of questions, but I don't want to uh, take up too much time. But um, um, I had perhaps a few questions first for for Yusra. I, I I loved your 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 presentation, and um, and so I was thinking a little bit more about um, how to respond to the criticism that international law is uh, too abstract. Um, and so I was I I thought it was interesting this this idea of well uh, trying to especially at the beginning of a course, explain why international law might be relevant to our daily lives. Uh, but I'm just wondering, how do we keep this up throughout the semester? Um, and whether your, your argument would uh, fit well with a kind of case study methodology that might uh, be make things less abstract instead of just teaching the rules, etc. Focusing on certain case studies might 
might make it a bit more uh, real for the students. And so I was just wondering whether you had other kind of methodological tricks to try and uh, make international law a bit less abstract. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, that's actually a great um, remark and um, question. Um, extending beyond what I said about simply trying to individualize it as much as possible, um, I think that anything that can kind of create links to what students might live through on a daily basis could be useful. So from a methodolo methodological sorry, standpoint, um, perhaps, uh, for instance, showing, uh, you know, bringing in um, like news snippets, newspaper articles, or like um, news, um, maybe even like snippets from YouTube or whatever. Like, I'm just thinking like media things that, but like very local media, right? Like things that would have happened like yesterday in your hometown where this is being taught. And then you know, relate it to the bigger picture of what is going on with regards to um, that. And I think that could maybe be a nice way to also like bring in some other um, sources um, into the way that you're actually teaching and especially like media sources that could also be um, something um, pretty captivating for students. Um, I would have said also just like, you know, making the connection as much with domestic case law, but I think that's quite obvious, especially because um, in, a, in pretty much all international teachings, there will be a section, at least in textbooks, dedicated to, you know, the links with municipal law, I think. So I think that that would be kind of the part of the semester where those kind of links would be created anyway. Um, so yeah, I would keep it at that, but I would actually be really interested in kind of passing the baton and if anybody else has any ideas on um, how, how, could, how that could better come to fruition. And I'll be taking note. <laughs> yes, Richard? Uh, you could ask students. I mean, I'm just going by a uh, perspective. One of the best teachers ever taught me international law. And she always asked, like, what were subjects that we were interested in, and always made an effort to address them. So that's one way of making it less abstract. If that's the oh, I love that. Yeah. Can I also just say, um, I mean, sometimes there are things happening around you, like in your own university. So if like teachers are striking, <laughs> that's like something you could always send out. I knew a teacher who actually did that. It was a senior who was teaching human rights, and he during strike time. He took uh, students out to, instead of crossing the picket line, he took them to the picket line as part of teaching them and also participating in the pickets. Oh. And then kind of then talking about, you know, as, as Anna said, like international labor is not talked about, but that's the way to talk about human rights, labor, things that are happening around you and everything. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, I, I did that uh, during the strikes uh, when I was uh, teaching international law tutorials in between strike days and uh, we discussed uh, the right to strike in international law and I thought it was also a good opportunity to explain why we were striking and uh, and also then link it back to the human rights lecture that we had uh, that week as well so um so but I completely agree with you that it's always I think students it's always interested to uh, uh, relate what they learn in the classroom to what they read and uh, what is happening around them. And I think that's something that is uh, usually quite uh, successful. Um, Barry, I think you, you had uh, maybe a few questions or did you want to come in? Yeah, no. So uh, first of all, thank you everyone for those presentations. They were extremely thought provoking. And I've just been trying to sort of, I've been sitting here trying to make sense of it all. Um, and it strikes me that um, just sort of reflecting on the presentations as a whole, there is sort of a distinction maybe that can be drawn between international law as a set of practices and ideas, and on the one hand, and international law as a profession and a career path on the other, right? Um, now, a lot of the presentations dealt with international law as a set of ideas and practices, and we had you know thoughts on disrupting the textbook, um, creating a podcast which makes you know a more informal method of actually talking about international law, um, thinking about the positionality of the teacher in, in Kyle's case, um, looking at the everyday practices of international law, 
um, as Yisra was talking about. Um, and these are all great ideas. And, and I think that, um, I do think that the kind of the younger generation of international academics coming through um, are doing a lot more to disrupt kind of these conventions. Um, I'm not even sure how many, I, and I was gonna put this to, to Anna Louise, I'm not even sure how many academics use textbooks anymore, especially the younger ones, right? I mean, I certainly don't really use them <laughs> in, in my teaching anymore. Um, so uh, that's an interesting background question is, you know, who's using these documents? Um, but what, the point I wanted to make is that, um, so you've got this, this international law as a set of ideas on the one hand, but then on the other, you've got international law as a profession. Um, and this was, uh, I think, touched on most strongly by uh, Richard. Um, and, and, you know, the problems of access and diversity in international law as a career. Um, and it strikes me that there is, you know, a bit of a tension here, right? Because on the one hand, uh, you have a, a lot of teachers who are doing their utmost to make the material more relevant, more everyday, uh, more uh, relevant to particular to, to different regions, to different discourses, etc. Um, but what what are we doing about uh, you know the, the kind of those who are looking at the international law from a more kind of career minded perspective, who actually want to practice international law, and all of the the barriers that exist there? Um, what are what are our responsibilities as teachers? there knowing what we know about how unfair hierarchical um you know and in many international organizations frankly exploitative and violent um the field is um so i just wanted to put that question out there for anyone really if they'd if they'd reflect on this uh, from the position of, of teaching um because it, it's something that i i'm sort of grappling with uh, at the moment just and yeah i'd really love to hear your thoughts Would you like me to take that question to start? Sure, go. And anyone, yeah, it's uh, an open floor. Um, so in terms of uh, how you can address that sort of thing in teaching, I think just being a wee bit more open about how the profession works in certain circles and how, like I was saying in my presentation, it's very much dependent on your networks. And maybe bring that sort of advice into teaching as well about what are the actual ways of landing, you know, a career, in international law um, and also some of the you know things to not do like basically to do and to don't list and yeah, just being a bit more open with students basically about what it entails because I think especially when you're starting off in fields like for example I want to go do human rights that everyone's like oh yeah I'm going to do human rights law this is uh, this would be a lot of fun and it's a very hard field to get into unless you've got the right type of connections so that should be one one wee tidbit would be, yeah, be more open with students about what it takes to actually get into the field. Hi. Yeah, I wonder if one thing that might be worth highlighting for students is just challenging their idea of what it means to actually practice international law and highlighting that it's not just that you work at the ICJ or the UN, but if you're interested in human rights, NGOs, um, civil society groups, or even highlighting, I think Anna Luisa's point drives home a lot of this. There's international law if you work in aviation, if you work in um, logistics transnationally, there's going to be areas of that that touch on international law. And I think showing students that it's not just you work at sort of this really particular level that we might emphasize a lot in international law scholarship, but thinking, well, what does it mean to actually do this? And where can you? And showing that there's perhaps a few more options than students might think when they first think of, well, what is international law? And if I want to do that, what does that mean? And I guess also to jump in on that, uh, and to maybe even go even further beyond what you can do in like career context where maybe you're not being a quote unquote international lawyer in that you're practicing for the various courts and tribunals, but you're doing something that has international legal consequences, but then even further, um, what about just your um, general interaction with people, especially uh, those who maybe uh, don't even know much about um, international law, if anything, and one of the things, just to give an example of this, that um, 
we discussed in uh, my human rights class this last term was um, international human rights and the populist backlash and what would it actually mean to have some kind of dialogue with uh, maybe individuals who are friends or family who are very outside the outside the, uh, the profession, outside even just having general knowledge of this, but maybe uh, are like have some sort of affinity to some of these more arguments that are fueling the backlash against things like international institutions. What would it mean to talk to them about their concerns in a way that is just not um, coming across as judging them for being ignorant that then uh, would only serve to further their interest in what uh, various demagogues say. And how is it by doing that, having these interactions, just being able to communicate with all different kinds of people, you might end up um, serving the ends of, um, of something like international human rights, um, even though that's um, not something you're doing in any kind of uh, professional capacity, but it really does go to show that there is that base social reality to all of this. I love that so much. Um, and I would just add to what, um, what Kyle said with regard to, um, it's very much in line with my own kind of beliefs and argument about just kind of understanding that, you know, whatever job that you're doing, like there is a chance that it has something to do with um, international law. And on a more practical level, I would say um, to the greatest degree possible, I think bringing in people in your classroom, like practitioners, people who work in different um, sectors of international law that are not necessarily the traditional ones. So not, you know, your ICJ legal officer or your like UN diplomat, but, you know, somebody who, does something a little bit different and kind of like offbeat and that might actually relate to international law in some way or another and expressing their views on that it might expand students minds as to how they can really kind of contribute to the discipline or how they might they already do maybe I think sorry just to kind of jump off further on that point I think one of the problems then is also then looking at the teacher and the law teacher or any teacher as also an international law practitioner, practitioner in their own right, because they're setting the imagination of what it means to know and practice quote unquote international law. Because students do come in with some interesting perceptions about I want to be the next Amal Clooney or Amal Clooney is my, you know, rock star celebrity crush or whatever. And all those perceptions have a certain, I think, utopianism attached to them, a certain kind of a status attached to them. That I, I think that perhaps one thing is trying to break that as teachers and be like actually it's a bit more than just being Amal Clooney or you know <laughs> or anybody else I don't know anybody else but yeah Anna Luisa yes yeah I, I I agree with everything that's been said but I think also if I I can tie this back also to my project I think <laughs> textbooks also uh, in a way foster this idea of a particular type of international lawyer. And we come to somehow also glorify textbooks writers as the uh, ideal of what an international lawyer really is. So we picture someone who goes and pleads before the International Court of Justice, but is also um, a professor on the side. And I, I think there's a lot more to international law rather than uh, the ICJ and even other international courts. There's a lot of international law um, litigation happening domestically. You can also deal uh, very much with international law if you are a legal advisor to uh, a specific ministry in your home country. You can work in the Ministry of Agriculture and still deal very much with issues of international law. So there's a lot more to it than just what is our common imagination of what an international lawyer uh, looks like. Thank you. That was an incredible set of answers. Uh, I have to say, um, it also reveals the kind of connections actually between disrupting the ideas and disrupting the profession, right? So you've actually just destroyed the tension which I tried to pose um, <laughs> quite nicely um, because I think, I think you make, uh, you know, really excellent points there. Um, and it is interesting to see how um, 
not only by teaching the everyday, but I guess by teaching the everyday practices in the weird, wonderful places that international law comes up, you can also maybe open up some of the sort of ideas for careers as well. Um, and they, those two can be connected. Uh, I really like that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I, I had a, a question uh, based on, on, on Richard's presentation on his uh, call to find methods to improve self-esteem uh, and morale between students. And I, I thought there was um, a, a very uh, nice way of putting it, especially because I think students are, are so anxious nowadays um, that it's, it's sometimes also difficult to uh, give them the confidence to uh, act or even to interrupt the, the teacher. Um, so already I, I liked your idea of, of uh, interrupting the, the, the teacher. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit uh, about how it worked and, and is it always the same students who interrupt you or do, do you actually think it actually opens up the, the classroom to more diverse voices? So that's an awesome question. In my experience, it doesn't open up the discussion immediately in the first few classes, because again, like I was saying, I think people that act or are extroverted are more likely to interrupt. But I, if you've ever been in a class with me, I do tend to make sure the students learn the material, but I'm also very informal. And I think over time, after you know four, five, six classes, I did see noticeable changes in wider class participation and also talking about stuff that has nothing to do with the material as well. Like I said, like the classroom can be a nice escape for students and teachers and you don't have to just chat about international law because, you know, the, 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 the way, you know, technology available today and everything, there's not much an international lawyer can teach that you can't find on Google. And I think if students are really interested and engaged, then they can go and look up these things for themselves. So it's not just about teaching the material. It's also about, you know, how we treat each other and, you know, just be nice to one another, basically, in the classroom and take a more relaxed approach to teaching, basically. And that's pretty much my short answer for that question. <laughs> Right, so we have still a few minutes. So if anyone from the audience has uh, uh, maybe a last minute question, just uh, feel free to uh, write it down in, in the chat. Um, and uh, and maybe I'll, I'll ask a question for, for Kyle then, uh, um, because I think your, your experience and your perspective coming from the international relations side is, is also um, uh, very rich. So um, I'm, I'm wondering if, if international law teacher should be a different teacher for international relations students or international law students and, and whether the international relations student is, is really a, a different student of international law um, is, it, is it just the, the perspective and the skills that they already have that makes them different from the international uh, law, from a law student, or is it their interest? What, what is the variable there? What, what makes them perhaps different? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the biggest difference isn't to do much with the student themselves, but with what sort of the goal for the course is for them. I think you know, we have very different goals in training law students than training IR students. So it's a sort of what do you try to get out of the course? What's the, what's this supposed to be helping you achieve is different. Um, as well, I mean, if you're approaching international law in a broader context to focused on international relations, international politics and that sort of curriculum is going to I think lead you to focus on different questions, prioritize different parts of it than if you're coming at it from a more deeply ingrained law school curriculum on it. Uh, I think like I mean the dream I think would be you know have international relations students take an entire you know semester long course in a law school and you know perhaps even do the same the other way around you know the dream, you know, notwithstanding institutional realities and constraints there, but I think it's, you're coming from different traditions, you're steeped in sort of different ideas, you're pondering different questions. They overlap a lot, but it's going to shape, I think, you know, what gets covered and why. So 
international relations, you're probably not going to cover a lot of, well, how do you actually, what are the, like the processes of filing a case and actually going, like, how does the European Court of Human Rights handle a case from start to finish isn't going to be usually a point of concern for an IR grad student. They're thinking more like, well, what are the standards? How has this changed over time? What are the outcomes? Um, it's just a, just one example. Great, thank you. Um, so I see we have one last question that I think is, is going to uh, conclude this session very well. So I'm going to ask it uh, to each of our panelists if they want to uh, conclude by uh, giving us maybe one or two recommendations uh, for young lawyers who want to be international law teachers so maybe in terms of, of methods or uh, what, 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 who is this international law teacher and how do we become an international law teacher um, so who wants to start Richard yes I can get a ball rolling but I would just have the caveat of it. it depends where you're based and obviously what level you want to teach at whether it's you know just for the general public or university or whatever but if it's at that you know if you want to call it the upper echelon the highest level and I put highest in quotation marks um, at the university level I'd say publish stuff because if it especially like I've seen in certain countries like the UK for example you're not going to be teaching international law at university unless you've published so that would be a tip of mine, publish in journals that people like to read. And if it's not at that level, then there's things that you can do in your local community. And I think that's what Ahmed was talking about as well, with respect to podcasts and that sort of thing. There's a lot of different ways to reach a wider audience than uh, within university institutions. Thank you. Any other tips? Oh, and I guess one that um, I would say, if you say maybe then get to that, um, place where you maybe have this opportunity to be an international law teacher, um, always be reflective on how is it that you actually learned the subject and think, what does that then mean for someone who has no knowledge of this and is just coming into it without any, um, any kind of uh, just experience of it and that. And I mean, one thing I've seen before is maybe people trying to get, um, students started on like maybe some of the more critical pieces in that because that was very helpful for their own thinking like we'll want to introduce some um, students through like the various works of like say marty koskinami and that um but then really be thinking like all this stuff that gave you that whole aha moment i get this now what kind of uh, prior knowledge did you have to have for any of that to even make sense. And what does that then mean for someone who is just in that position of just starting out, has no real um, idea of it, but is eager to learn. And also what that means in terms of just what the larger field for all of its uh, flaws and shortcomings thinks as knowledge. And how is it that you have to uh, master that base understanding before you can then maybe do more critical, oppositional, or interesting things. Fascinating. Well, thank you. I think it, it really concludes uh, this panel uh, perfectly. So I'd like to thank uh, our speakers uh, really for wonderful presentations and, and such a, an interesting uh, discussion. A big thank you to, to the audience also for uh, very interesting questions and for, for being here today. And I think now I'm just uh, hand over back to Jean-Pierre for the final thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Leslie. Um, nothing much from me, uh, from me at this stage. I just want to take another opportunity to thank everyone who's been involved in making this, these webinars happen. Um, we've had two excellent webinars today. Um, really interesting insights and a lot to think about moving forward. Um, just two quick things. So first of all, thank you very much to you, Leslie Ann, um, for your chairing. Um, and just a reminder to our audience to continue the conversation either on social media, et cetera, or by getting in touch with the speakers or with us as the organizers. And that the next round and the final day of webinars in this series will be on Friday, the 23rd of April. So there's a bit more time between now, between this 
these webinars and the next round just because of the Easter break um, in between. But we look forward to seeing everyone back on Friday, the 23rd of April at 11 a.m. Um, and the two sessions on that day will be teaching international law in the Arab world um, and decolonizing the teaching of international law. So we very much look forward to welcoming you back. And thank you very much again to all our speakers today and to you, Leslie Ann. And have a good rest of the afternoon and a good weekend, everyone. Thank you.